What a wonderful name it is. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So much is contained in that name, Jesus. As I was trying to, to wrap up this holiday season and, and think of the idea of Christmas and last night, um, It's a Wonderful Life is on. I don't know if you've seen it. It's been around for a little while. And, uh, I, you know, I'm one, I, you guys know, my wife calls me Scrooge, um, you know, because she likes to put on all the Christmas shows. And I'm like, you know, I, I saw it. You know, I know how it ends. And, uh, and so last night it was on, and I was like, oh. And then my wife was asking me to do a few other things, and I didn't want to get up because I didn't want to miss the good part. And I'm like, oh, it, you know, I guess I am more sentimental than I think I am. But it's interesting because in all of these things, we portray Christmas and what it means for Christmas. We talk about Jesus is the reason for the season. And yet, we live in a world that is increasingly willing to take Jesus out of it. Right? I mean, this past year, uh, Bucksport had a, sort of a, a tug of war with another group about whether or not to put the nativity set or not. I, you know, I shared with you that there are increasing number of parades now that are excluding churches because they, they don't apply to the sort of the, the new inclusive philosophy, right? That everything goes. And I find it interesting that so many in this world are can separate Jesus from in Christmas and still say, you know, we're celebrating Christmas without Jesus. And it's missing the whole point. And we talk about the reason why Christmas. And so today is really going to be a, a real simple message. It's probably nothing you've never heard before, but I think it's a good reminder for us. I mean, obviously, you could have been doing a whole lot of other things this morning, but you chose to be here. You chose to watch online and be a part of all this. But it's so easy for it all to be watered down in amongst of everything else. Because we don't need another holiday to eat. You know? Actually, I don't need a holiday to eat at all. I, I like to eat all the time. I mean, so that's, you know. And, uh, but they have the turkey and the stuffing. and I'm curious. How many guys, t- turkey for Christmas? How many turkeys for Christmas? All right. Ham for Christmas. Oh, I'm surprised. The hammers. All right. Goose. Does anyone have, I mean, you think all the, I've never had a Christmas goose. Has anyone here had a Christmas goose? Oh, one, two, okay. Yeah. It's a, you know, I, uh, enchiladas. I, I, every, I plug for that every year and it ain't going to happen. But, uh, you know, we don't need another holiday to eat. You know, oftentimes we talk about Christmas and it's like, oh, it's another opportunity for family. And, and it is a good thing, right? It's good to have families who get together. It's good to have events that we can give family together because oftentimes we don't do that enough. I always think it's one of the saddest things is you show up at a funeral and people are like, oh, I haven't seen you since the last funeral. Right? And I'm like, that's kind of sad. We have to actually wait for someone to die for us all to get together. But Christmas isn't just for another opportunity for us to gather together with, with family and friends. You know, there's a lot of gift giving at our house this morning. You know, we always sort of set a limit of budget wise, and somehow that always kind of get a little bit smidged over. And look underneath the tree, and we have more than what we need and more we do deserve. God is just blessed. And as much as I like getting gifts and love giving, giving, giving gifts, Christmas isn't about that. So I just want to go really quick. I have three things I talked about why Christmas. And each one, I think, kind of 
Escalade's done itself. Let me just hopefully I'll explain what I mean. The first one, why Christmas? It, because it's to show us God. It's to show us God. I know a lot of us have turned around and, and prayed, and you ever felt like your prayers just kind of go up somewhere? You know, is there someone on the other side, end of the line? I think of Moses who turned around and, and said, Lord, I want to see you when, up on that mountain on Sinai. And God's like, no, because no man can look on God and live. And So he told Moses, you know, kind of tuck around the corner and I'm going to kind of pass by and, and don't look until I tell you. And, he, and, and the Lord passed by and says, okay. And, and Moses got to see kind of the back of, of God. And how all firing that was and actually Moses left that mountain and the Bible says that he glowed from the radiancy of God the holiness of God had, had impacted him that he came down the mountain and actually glowed and people were like Moses cover your face up we don't want to see that you know that's, that's kind of creepy and the Bible tells us no one has seen God at any time it says in the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him when Jesus came, became flesh, when he came down about, among us, God came down. Emmanuel, God with us. That when we beheld and when we look at Jesus, we read about him, we hear his words, that's from God. Philip, one of his disciples, said to him, Lord, show us the Father and is a, a sufficient for us. Right? Just show us God. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? You know, this past winter we were showing the, the Chosen Sunday night. And actually I know season three is out until probably the first of the year. We'll set up the big screen again and we'll probably have ice cream and goodies and watch the chosen and and one of the things that does is the powerfulness of it is seeing god in a, in a light that we don't see him as before that in here we see what the love of god looks like we see a god who longs to have fellowship with us And Jesus contains God. And I think in a way that we would not understand if Jesus hadn't have come. That God is approachable. You know, I'm often with the psalmist who says, you know, what is, what is man that you're mindful of him? Why, why does God even care? I'm one little bleep among seven billion little bleeps on this world. In a universe that's full of so many stars and planets and moons. Yeah, the Bible says God knows my name. How many hairs are on my head? How many pounds I've gained since Thanksgiving? He knows all these things. That's the God that we worship and we celebrate. That he revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ in a way none of us would have understood. That in here we see God and his will. Actually, Jesus says this. He says, And then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. In a nutshell, Jesus says, you know what? There's nothing that I, I do that's not the Father's will. Think about that. That everything that Jesus did 
he did by the power of God the Father. And that shows us when Jesus goes to the leper and touches him. That's what God does. When he goes to the woman at the well who's been rejected. He waited for her there, knowing that she would show up. That's the God that we worship. God who sat down with sinners. Now, it's interesting that we look at this and we talk about God and, and you know, in here we, we try to clean ourselves up. We, we try to put on this, this facade of, of perfection. And yet, you see, Jesus hung out not with the righteous, but with the sinners. That's what God does. That God draws us in. And when we can't reach him, he reaches us. The Bible shows us that he became human. It's interesting, over all the, the years I've been preaching and doing Sunday school classes, I think one of the, the classes that most people had the hardest time with is I did a study on the humanity of Christ. That Jesus came down fully human, like you and I. God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And remember, I started off the class, we talked about the idea of that first Christmas, that Jesus came as a babe. And I said, that night when he was born, you know, I, I was there when my children were born. It's not a pretty sight. I was watching a, a movie that portrayed the nativity, and it was interesting because Mary came in and she looks at Joseph, she says, it's time. And Joseph's like calm and collected, says, okay. Listen, you tell any guy it's time, panic ensues, all right? But he was just like, okay. And so he brought her in, and he fluffed up the hay, and all of a sudden there was this light that shone, and the next thing was Mary was holding the baby. I don't think it happened that way. It was messy. The pain of labor, the stress, the worries. That's how Jesus came into this world. And I remember teaching a class, I, we, I talked about how God had his diaper changed. Think about that. The God, the creator of the universe, humbled himself for he had to be fed from his mother. Wrapped in a blanket. And I mentioned Jesus had his diaper changed and afterwards I had a lady come up and she goes, I don't think I can come to this class. I said, Why? because Jesus didn't have a diaper. Let me tell you, if he didn't, that was one of the biggest miracles that was ever, that he survived five years without a diaper. But he came in all points like us. That he can associate with us. John wraps it up really well in the first chapter of John. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The humanity of God. That's what Christmas is partially about. He came into this world like you. He didn't choose a, a rich, wealthy family, a, 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 a family that had political power and, and abilities and means. Actually, you read the scriptures that when Jesus was dedicated in the temple, they brought a couple of doves, the, the offering of a, of a poor family. Because Mary and Joseph didn't have much. Now, even when Jesus started his ministry, people were like, who are you? You're just a carpenter's kid. 
Who are you to, to teach us? The book of Isaiah tells us that there is nothing in him that was seemly. There is nothing in him that was attractive. And in this, Jesus knows what it's like. So much so, the writer of Hebrews says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. That in here, Jesus says, come. When we go to prayer, we can lay it all down. We can be honest with him. Because he knows. He knows. Actually, just real quick, I was going through and trying to think of things that is throughout the scriptures. The Bible says he knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to struggle. Of not having. You know, in our lives, there's, we've had ups and downs, and we didn't always have turkey and stuffing. I'm getting hungry. We didn't have all those things all the time. When my wife and I were first married, we were in Bible school, and we didn't have two nickels to rub, rub together. Actually, I remember we had a week or so where we ate oatmeal. And we thought it was special because we bought a little packet of raisins to put in it. And if you close your eyes, it's almost like having meat. But that's what we had. And if you've struggled, if you've gone through difficulties, you know, it's hard because sometimes you talk to other people and, you know, they don't get it. There's some people who've, who've never had to... We had another couple in school that they both had jobs and things were going well and their families would send them money and, they, and send them food and care packages. And so we're going through Bible school, we're eating oatmeal and they were eating pretty, pretty good. And so we're talking about some of the struggle we're going through and they're like, oh yeah, we know what it's like, you know, because we ran out of gravy. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you, you have no clue, right? You, you know how it is. You talk to people uh, who, maybe in your relationships and your struggles, and you talk to people who have never been through it. God's not that way at all. God knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew it was the thirst. He knew what it was like to be tired. Actually, you read the Gospels, and, and there's several times when Jesus' disciples or his family pulled him aside and said, Jesus, you've got to slow down. You're doing too much. Now, we see Jesus often falling asleep. You know, and sometimes we, I think we miss some of the point because we see Jesus, you know, he's in a boat, he's been preaching all day. He gets into a boat, they're crossing over, and the storm is so bad, and Jesus is what? He's asleep in the boat. Why? Because Jesus was tired. And he was tired from, from doing the, the Father's will, but it still took a toll on him physically. You ever been around people all day and they just kind of suck the energy out of you? And people come to you with their problems and after a while, that just kind of wears you down. Jesus knows what it's like. Think about it, you know. It's interesting, we talk about all oh, Jesus was ministering, and thousands of people came out, and he healed each one of them. Guess what? Each one of those people that came to him had a problem that they poured out at him. And Jesus knew what it was like to be tired. He knew what it was like to have joy. To laugh, to celebrate, to go to a wedding, to go celebrate a holiday. Jesus knows what it's all like. He knows what it's like to have lack. At one point, Jesus had to pay taxes, and he didn't have the money to pay his own taxes. And he sent the disciples off to go fishing, and they found a coin in the mouth of a fish to provide for what he had. 
You know, it's interesting because, you know, you turn on the TV and sometimes you see these TV evangelists and you see these people, with, you know, all the cufflinks and all the pinky rings and you see all this thing out here. And, oh, yeah, you can have it all. You know, Jesus knew what it's like not to have anything. Actually, one of his disciples came to him and said, look, I want to follow you. And he says, look, you know, the birds have nests, the foxes have holes. Guess what? I have nowhere to lay my head. You felt like that? Jesus knows. He knows what it's to be sorrowful. He knows what it's like to be rejected. You ever had a friend stab you in the back? Jesus knows what it's like. One of the very twelve betrayed him with a kiss. Come to him, because he knows. In here, he knows what it's like to experience pain. You know, in our sickness, in our struggles, Jesus knows. He knows what it's like to die. Not his own death only, but the death of friends. The shortest verse of the Bible is Jesus at a Lazarus' funeral. Is what? Jesus, he wept. Because he knows. See, not only do we know what God is like because of Jesus, but God knows what we're like and experiences that. That's why he says, come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find mercy. He doesn't turn us away. He says, come. You know, I find one of the great mysteries is oftentimes people who are struggling, and I'm like, have you talked to God about it? And they're like, eh, he would, you know, he wouldn't understand. Yes, he does. Oh, it's just a small problem. Nothing small. He says, come. Come to me, all you are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. See, Christmas is about God becoming man. That he may know us. Lastly, and I think this is the most important of it all, that Jesus came to die for our sins. It's interesting because you go down through and you talk about all oh, the baby Jesus. Jesus is the reason for the season. But you've got to ask why. Why did he come? Why did he leave heaven to come here? Why Christmas? Because we needed a Savior. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because I sin, I deserve death. Separation from God for all eternity. God doesn't send me to hell. I deserve hell for what I do. But God loves us. And all throughout the Old Testament, we see this picture. We have these sacrifices. As far as it's impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. All those sacrifices was not enough to save a single person. Then why? Then why did they sacrifice these lambs and bulls and goats? Because each one of those was a picture of the sacrifice that was going to come. Think of it this way. Each one of those sacrifices was like an IOU to God. A lamb is going to come, a perfect lamb. That will be the ultimate sacrifice. And when Jesus started his ministry, John the Baptist declared this. This is... On the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, What? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We needed a perfect sacrifice for my sins and for yours. And Jesus became that sacrifice. 
Peter says it this way, but with the precious blood of Christ, as, a, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was ordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifested in these last times. With the precious blood of Jesus Christ, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it says in this verse that before the foundations of the world, before all creation, he knew that man would sin. He knew we would fall. And he knew that he would come to die for you. Think about that. You ever got to a point in your life you kind of look back and you're like, oh man, if I would have known all this was going to happen, I would have quit a long time ago. God looked down through eternity and saw you. And he saw you lost in your sin. He saw you going to a place called hell. He saw the struggles that you would face. And he died for you anyways. Think about that. He did all of this for you. Knowing it would cost him everything. That's why Christmas. So you got to understand the, the sacrifice that was required had to be a person but without sin. And that's a problem. I can't pay for your sin. You know why? Because I got my own. And all our righteousness are filthy rags. I can't earn my salvation. I'm never good enough. And he became that. Hebrews says, Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus told the Pharisees, you're of your father, the devil. You know what? I fall for his tricks all the time. Satan is leading this world on a highway to hell. And they're going. And we see this every day played out. And yet, Jesus came into this world to break that bond. I don't have to go that way. I don't have to be what I used to be. I don't have to follow the world. Jesus Christ has given me the detour to deliver me from these things. He beckons you to come along. That's why Christmas. That he became flesh and blood. That he may take away my sins. That he could die in my place. The Bible says, according to the law, almost everything was purified by blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. As it is appointed man to die once, but after this is judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. It is appointed on a man once to die, and after this I face judgment. The Bible says it's a fearful day to fall into the hands of the living God. That man will be without excuse. So I don't stand before the Father and says, Hey, let me into heaven because I'm good. Because I'm not. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because he died in my place. 100% God. Holy and pure. 100% man. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That is Christmas. Paul wraps it up here. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The ultimate trade. God the Father traded his son for you. 
the one who had no sin became your sin. That's Christmas. The in this, we are now declared righteous because of him. See, God is love and he's grace, but he's also righteous and he's holy. See, only perfect people can go to heaven. And guess what? I ain't it. But he took my sin and gave me his righteousness. That in here, the love of God is satisfied in that he's died to save us. But in here, his holiness, his righteousness is sacrificed and his punishment was poured out upon Christ. See, Christmas is us coming to the Father through Jesus Christ. He came to die to pay for your penalty, for your sin, what you deserved, and he took it all upon himself. And in there, he pours out his love and righteousness on you because you don't deserve it. That's the ultimate Christmas gift. You know, the world says, oh, we can have our parades without Jesus. Oh, we can give gifts without Jesus. You know, we can celebrate and do all these things. And we don't need Jesus in Christmas. Let me tell you something, you can't. Because you know what? Keep Jesus and take everything else out. And you have Christmas. Christmas is Christ. But the fear comes in. See, if we keep Jesus in Christmas, then that means we have to ask why he came. And we can't, he came because we're sinners. That's what the world doesn't want to hear. The world doesn't want to hear that they need a Savior. But that's what we need. The ultimate gift of Christmas is Jesus' Son. Or Jesus, his Father's Son. That he came to die for you. And today we celebrate that. He died for me, he died for you. And folks, if you have that, you have the best gift of all. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son. Lord, God became flesh and, built and dwelt among us, Lord. What a, what a wonder that is. Then here we look at Jesus and, and Father, you've been revealed through him. That Lord, he became flesh. That he knows what we're going through. He knows what it's like. And Lord, he came to die. He was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. And in this, Lord, is salvation. What a gift that is. That trade of my sin for your righteousness. Oh Lord, what a mighty gift that is. And Lord, all we can do is love you back. That's our Christmas gift to you, Lord. Help us to love you and serve you. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.